Hello, good evening. This is the All 24 News. And coming up next in our program. In Sudan, the reinstated Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdouk promised that he would release all political detainees. Turning their joy to her, a car has flowed through Christmas spirit in the U.S. state of Wisconsin, can you five and injuring at least 40 people plus. And they announced three a full national lockdown with a huge protest against the new government's restriction. Hello again. First, in our top stories, according to the city of Wikashka, a car has flowed through Christmas parade in the U.S. state of Wisconsin, killing five and injuring at least 40 people, turning their joy to horror. More to be clarified in this report. A tragedy in Waukesha, Wisconsin, after at least five people were dead and more than 40 were injured when a car crashed into a parade. Social media footage showed the vehicle breaking through barriers and speeding into the road where the Christmas parade was taking place. Shocked by the incident, people, including families and children, fled for their lives as the car sped off, knocking down dozens of people. Officials in Waukesha warned that the number of fatalities and injuries could change as additional information is collected. The City of Waukesha Fire Department and its, partner, its partners in Mavis transported a total of 11, of 11 adults and 12 pediatric patients to six area hospitals. Um, we do not have any specifics on the, on the injuries at, at this time. Um, all of the patients were transported. Um, there are uh, uh, there were some fatalities. Um, we do not have any detailed information on the fatalities at this time. Police officer had shot at the SUV in an unsuccessful bid to stop the vehicle as it crashed through street barriers. Officers say they have not discounted terrorism as a motive, but they also believe to be looking into the possibility the suspect was fleeing an earlier knife incident when he reached the parade route. It's unknown at this time whether the incident has any nexus to terrorism. To the families involved, you are in Waukesha Police Department thoughts and prayers. To the Waukesha community, the scene is now safe and secure. A picture captured later at an unknown location showed what appeared to be the vehicle involved backed on to a driveway with the hood badly dented and bent up. It is unclear how the vehicle came to be there and police have not revealed exactly how the suspect was arrested. The first round of Chilean votes resulted well for the far-right former legislator Jose Antonio Cast after he finished on the top ahead of the leftist lawmaker and former protest leader Gabriel Boric. The candidates will meet next month, December 19th, in Chile's presidential runoff elections will end. Fatigue and fear the Chileans lived through the past two years as Cass said that the elections are choice between liberty and communism. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro congratulated the United Socialist Party for winning the post of regional presidents in 20 states besides in the capital Caracas and the local elections that took place in Venezuela on Sunday. More in the support. The camp of President Nicolas Maduro scored a landslide victory in the local elections on Sunday, according to what the National Electoral Council announced. Shortly after the first results were published, President Nicolas Maduro celebrated the triumph. As a result of the efforts of the 24 federal regions of our country and the great national poll, the revolutionary forces won 21 positions, including uh, in the capital of Venezuela, Caracas, and this is 21 out of 24 regions, which is the result of hard work, a result that sheds light on the truth. The power camp won 20 out of 23 governorships in the mire of Caracas in the face of the divided opposition that participated for the first time in a vote since 2017 after it had previously boycotted the presidential and legislative elections. Information from the Venezuela National Electoral Council announced these results after 90% of the votes were counted, while the participation rate 
in the election was 41%. As for the Venezuelan opposition, it won according to the preliminary results the local elections in three states, expressing reservation and considering that the late closing of polling stations may have led to fraud. These elections constitute a victory for the Venezuelan regime, which is seeking to lift sanctions imposed on it after the re-election of Nicolas Maduro as president of Venezuela in 2018, which was not recognized by part of the international community. Into Europe descended into a third day of violence carnage as tens of thousands of people in Belgium took the streets to protest against the return of the strict lockdown rules amid the curbing rise of COVID infection. Zahra reports. Europe's protests against COVID-19 curbs spread to Brussels on Sunday when tens of thousands of demonstrators marched through the city center. The protest came just hours after Germany followed Austria's example in making vaccination compulsory, with ministers admitting that the move is unavoidable amid the fourth wave of the pandemic, which is crippling the country's hospitals. Many among the estimated 35,000 people at the rally had already left for home when the demonstration descended into violence. Police made more than 40 arrests after several shops were broken into, and videos on social media showed barricades on fire and police cars badly damaged. Belgium has one of the highest vaccination rates in Europe. However, it is reimposing restrictions as cases soar. The country's most vaccinated province, West Flanders, has one of the highest infection rates in the country. Last week, the government expanded work-from-home rules and strengthened restrictions on the unvaccinated. Austria has returned to a full national lockdown as protesters against new restrictions aimed at curbing COVID-19 infections spread across Europe. From midnight, Australians have been asked to work from home and non-essential shops have closed. And yet, on what follow. Austrian government succeeded relatively to reconfine its population and a desperate try to decrease the spiraling number of COVID-19 cases in the country. This action took place starting from Monday, as citizens are under the obligation of staying home with severe restrictions by the forces, which doesn't permit the people to go out except for necessary activities, including shopping for groceries or going to the doctor. This lockdown was imposed as the average number of deaths is hiking, and hospitals warned that their intensive care units are reaching capacity. The quarantine will last 10 days, with the possibility of extension that can reach 20 days. Austrian Chancellor Alexander Schallenberg announced last week that there would be a mandate for vaccination. However, he didn't give any further explanation on how the mandate would work. But the government stated that the citizens who do not abide by the vaccination rules would face fines. The rate of infections in Austria is rising very rapidly, and vaccination rates are insufficient for the Western European nation to hold off the winter wave. However, the country witnessed fierce protest and the city of Vienna in refusal of the vaccination on Saturday. The African countries remain far behind the vaccination process as most African countries still rely on supplies from overseas, despite efforts take initiative to produce jobs locally. Nabil reports. As countries around the world hit COVID vaccine milestones, many African nations remain worryingly behind in their initial plans to provide jabs for their citizens. Africa has so far largely relied on supplies from overseas as most of the vaccines that have reached the continent have come via Vaccines Global Access Initiative or also known as COVAX Initiative or through donations. African countries have now a production line with the capacity to produce 50 million COVID vaccine doses per year, a goal set to develop vaccines with African Union member states and secure sustainable vaccine production capacities, a step that will also improve overall medical care in Africa. Moderna, for instance, has confirmed that Rwanda, Senegal and South Africa could all be potential sites for the planned vaccine factory in Africa. It is true that there is a huge shortage of doses in Africa. The biggest challenge remains actually in vaccinating people. As a result, thousands of vaccine doses have been destroyed in African countries because they have exceeded their expiry dates. Others are being returned by countries saying they will be enabled to use them. 
countries like Malawi destroyed almost 20,000 doses and South Sudan announced it would destroy around 60,000 doses. The reason is that many countries failed to prepare adequately before receiving the vaccines. Africa is in a very tough spot when it comes to supply and many factors are leading to delays including a lack of funds and trained professionals and hesitancy among the population to get the vaccine. All are holding back the rollout. Head officials says that two people among a group of 17 U.S. and Canadian miniseries kidnapped by an armed gang in Haiti last month have been released. The abduction of the missionaries and their family members, including children, was reported on the 16th of October. They were returning from a visit on the orphanage when the bus they were traveling in was seized by gang members on the main road in the town of Ganthir, east of the capital, Port-au-Prince. All of those abducted at the time, five men, seven women, and five children, are U.S. citizens, except one who is Canadian national. The gang reported to be behind the kidnapping, which goes by the name of 400 Mazuwo, later demanded the ransom of 100 million for each of the 70 people being held. A summit between China and ASEAN national nations was held virtually without a representative from Myanmar. The latter had earlier set out the previous ASEAN summits after its members failed to come to conscious on allowing representation from the military run state administration council. Zara Ferjani on what follow. Chinese President Xi Jinping on Monday made a rare appearance in a special online summit with leaders from the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, emphasizing Beijing's strong commitment to the bloc and promising to buy billions of dollars worth of Asian farm products. ASEAN sees China as the key influence to help address the ongoing crisis in Myanmar after the military takeover in February. However, Monday's summit underscored the difficulty of making progress. According to Malaysian Foreign Minister Saifuddin Abdullah, Myanmar pulled out of the meeting at the 11th hour. All nine ASEAN countries have agreed with China's ambassador to Beijing to be representatives for Myanmar in this morning's session. However, this morning's sessions didn't get any resolutions. Beijing has suggested that Myanmar's ambassador to China could represent the military regime. Saifuddin told reporters that the bloc had agreed to this because ASEAN wanted to maintain the position of Myanmar in the grouping, and it was the understanding until late last night. An empty chair. But at least there was some kind of consensus as to who uh, would represent uh, Myanmar. At least there was a name. So this is, to my mind, an improvement than what we have had at the ASEAN uh, summit. There we don't even have a name. Myanmar joined ASEAN in 1997 under a previous military regime. The members of the summit said that Myanmar is an integral part of the ASEAN family and their membership has not been questioned. Sudanese Army Chief Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdouk reached an agreement that includes that letters return to the presidency of the Sudanese government and this release of civilian leaders detained since the military coup last month. Zara again on what follow. Developments that may change the Sudanese scene, a crucial meeting took place between the president of the Sudanese Sovereignty Council, Abdul Fattah al-Burhan, and the ousted Prime Minister, Abdullah Hamdouk, during which they reached an agreement to resolve the current political crisis. According to media reports, the United National Initiative in Sudan announced the approval of Abdullah Hamdouk's return as Prime Minister during the transitional period, in parallel with calls for demonstrations in rejection of the decisions previously taken by the Sudanese Army Chief Abdul Fattah al-Burhan. The agreement, according to the statement of the initiative, which includes academics, journalists and politicians, includes the release of all political detainees, the completion of consultations with political forces, with the exception of the National Congress Party, in addition to continuing the procedures for constitutional, legal and political consensus that govern the transitional period. This comes at a time when the Central Council of the Forces of Freedom and Change announced its adherence to reject negotiations and partnership with those it described as revolutionaries. 
The Sudanese Professionals Association, which played an essential role during the uprising that led to the overthrow of Omar al-Bashir in April 2019, also asked the Sudanese to continue pressing for the return of the city, calling for a number of gatherings throughout the week, including a massive million demonstration on Sunday. Saying Sudan complications are still in the high level, my Prime Minister was reinstated by the army on Chief Brown. The act federal brutal reaction of the people who took the streets of Al Khartoum to express the rage of refusing any military interference in any deal. The reinstated Prime Minister promised that he would release all political detainees. Abdullah Hamdouk spent around a month in house arrest of the coup data held by the key pro-democracy group, which deployed dozens wide protests. The deal was signed and cast on the Sudanese state TV. However, the act doesn't reveal how far the action of people would go and how would the army react to these events. After the accusation of EU the Belarusian government about arranging the migration surge, Alexander Lukashenko urged Germany to accommodate about 200 migrants who had remained on border with Poland and condemned EU officials for refusing to negotiate to an end. The European Union accuses Belarus of flying in thousands of people from the Middle East and pushing them to cross into its borders via Poland. Last Thursday, the European Commission and Germany publicly rejected the Belarus proposal in which it urged European Union countries to take in 2,000 of the migrants currently on its territory. Belarus does not want confrontation with Poland, but wants the European Union to take in 2,000 migrants stranded on its border. Lukashenko said Belarus was preparing a second flight to send migrants home at the end of the month. The plan would also include Minsk sending some 5,000 migrants back home. Poland has threatened to cut a train link between the two countries if the situation does not improve. Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki warned on Sunday that the migrant crisis on the Belarus border may be a starter to something much worse. Despite clearing the main migrant camps by the border last week and sending over 400 Iraqis back to Iraq in the first such return flight since August, Poland says Belarusian forces were still shipping migrants to the frontier. The Polish border guard said on Monday that a group of 150 migrants tried to break through the border near the village of Dobici Cerkiewne. Lithuanian border guard says 70 migrants were prevented from entering and two Ukrainian citizens were arrested on Sunday in two separate but similar incidents as they arrived at the border to pick up the migrants, presumably for further transportation. So it was 2,000, not 200, as I have mentioned. Another story, the head of the Libyan interim government, Abdel Hamid Beba, presented this candidacy paper for papers for the presidential election scheduled for the end of the next month to be the last prominent candidate for the election. Dibiabel's move was expected after the final submit his end and family's financial disclosure to the Anti-Corruption Commission. The details in what follow. Abdel Hamid Beba, head of the Government of National Unity in Libya since March 15, 2021, officially filled on Sunday his presidential candidacy schedule for December 24. Today I submit my candidacy file to serve you and not otherwise in the upcoming presidential elections. We have started the journey together and we will complete it together and we have raised from the beginning the slogan of no war anymore and Libya will only be united, secure and sovereign state in which Libyans live in prosperity. The Beba's move was expected after he finally submitted his and his family's financial disclosure to the Anti-Corruption Commission, a procedure that precedes submitting the candidacy file to the Electoral Commission. Last February, the Libyan National Dialogue Committee, under the supervision of the United Nations, chose the 61 years old engineer and businessman as a prime minister for the transitional period, with the aim of preparing the country for elections on December 24. It's worth mentioning that last week Beba criticized the House of Representatives, accusing it of implementing non-consensual electoral legislation that could undermine the electoral process, noting that he intends to submit his candidacy for the presidential elections at the appropriate time. And tomorrow's post updates. Let's hear this report.
Lyon's League One home match against Marseille was abandoned after Dimitri Payet was hit by a battle hurled by a spectator, heaping fresh embarrassment on the French game. Former West Ham playmaker Payet was preparing to take a corner amid a hostile atmosphere when he was struck on the side of the head by a plastic bottle full of liquid. He immediately went to ground and needed treatment, prompting referee Reddy Packet to take the players off the pitch. Lyon president Jean-Michel Olas later said a spectator had been arrested in connection with a battle throw-in and offered an apology to Payet. The Frenchman has yet again rejected Manchester United's proposal to take over in the Old Trafford hot seat, potentially leading the club's hierarchy into the path of the Mauricio Pochettino. The Norwegian was dismissed from his post in the Old Trafford hot seat on Sunday morning after overseeing a number of disastrous results in recent weeks. Zidane's United rejection could in turn spark managerial merry-go-round as the ex-Los Blancos boss is rumored to be interested in taking the Paris Saint-Germain role should current manager Mauricio Pochettino end up in Manchester. According to reports, Xavi has identified his former asset striker Baghdad Bounidja as an affordable answer to Barcelona's lack of firepower. The new Barca boss is keen to be reunited with Algerian international Baghdad Bounidja, who was a prolific performer during Xavi's time at the Qatar Stars League side and is viewed as an affordable and accessible answer to Barcelona's problem in front of goal in the absence of Conaguero, Martin Braithwaite and Osman Dembele. Bounidja, 29 years old, has bagged 169 goals in 165 appearances for a said since joining from Etoile de Sahel in 2015 and has 17 and 5 assists in 20 games for the Qatar side so far in the calendar year. The departure away of something you really love was and will always be the harsh moment someone can experience. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's last words as Red Devil manager published by Manchester United. Uh, then when I came, and I made great friends. I've reconnected with some great friends. Uh, new new staff coming in. Uh, I've become really good friends with the other staff that was here when I was there. We've good friends and we we've connected. And that is um, that's what it's about at a club like this with the fans, because the fans have been amazing from day one at Cardiff till. Till the last one now, so top, and we'll see each other. Venezuela's country's government announced that Venezuela's national system of youth and children's orchestra has set the Guinness record for the world's largest orchestra. The announcement came during a broadcast that showed Guinness world record expert Susana Reyes announcing that the musician successfully set a new record by playing Slavonic March for more than five minutes. Nadia Kasmiripos. After preparations for more than a week, close to 12,000 musicians from the Venezuelan orchestra gave a 12-minute performance of Slavonic March in the country yard of the Venezuelan Military Academy to break world Guinness record. Performers aged between 12 and 77 wore black pants, white shirts and mandatory face masks were brought together by the country's publicly funded El Sistema program. Independent supervisors were in charge of verifying the attempt of about 12,000 musicians, including both children and adults from the orchestra who played for the record on November the 13th. However, according to the certificate issued by the organization Guinness World Records, recognized only 8,573 of them as having set the record. Around 250 observers from the Venezuelan arm of the accounting company KPMG were present at the event to audit the effort. Each performer had to play an instrument for at least five minutes of the piece and not share instruments for the effort to succeed. It's worth mentioning that the record had been previously held by a Russian orchestra of 8,097 musicians who played the country's national anthem in St. Petersburg, Russia. Guinness recalls always the best things to be seen in this world. To this end, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us. Take care of yourself. Good night.